You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the gun! Hey yo, imagine seeing you here. Reliving the War episode 177, March 15th, 1999. This week we've got Raw coming from San Jose, California, while Nitro takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio. You'll need to check out the Uncensored 99 video before watching this week's episode of Reliving the War. The Hogan vs Flair cage match was pretty controversial and we can only hope that answers will be given tonight on Nitro. Basically, Hollywood Hogan was screwed out of the WCW Championship so this leaves the doors wide open for new storyline opportunities. The WWF, meanwhile, are truly on the road to WrestleMania. The Rock's causing a little turmoil within the corporation, so let's get straight into it and see what happened this week on both Raw and Nitro. Nitro begins right away with David Flair getting seduced by Denise. If you missed last week's episode of Reliving the War then you'll need to go back and get all caught up with this angle. I'm not explaining it all again. This week WCW broke segments up with actual matches in between but let's get it all out of the way right now so we can focus on the good stuff. David checks into a hotel, it's probably the Smackdown Hotel, and Denise says she recognises David from the TV. She then worms her way into David's room after saying she needs to use his phone, and we then see Kevin Nash and Tori Wilson watching all this go down, they've set up a spy camera. Turns out that David Flair's fallen in love with Tori, he doesn't fall for the trap. He says the line, are you trying to seduce me Mrs Robinson in reference to the graduate and we David tells this temptress to get out of his room because he only has eyes for Tori. Tori thinks David was being very sweet but Kevin Nash isn't happy with how this all turned out. Kevin needs to come up with another plan but he definitely thinks Tori's caught feelings for young David Flair. A segment then airs named Rapping with the Cat and it's basically Ernest Miller answering questions while putting himself over is the greatest. He says he has no respect for wrestlers, he's a karate expert and WCW are throwing chumps at the cat in an effort to stop him from reaching the top. The man who defeated Ernest Miller and Sonny Ono last night, Jerry Flynn, was featured in the Nitro opening match. Jerry Lynn with an F took on the manliest man to ever walk the planet, Ming, and Jerry Flynn got destroyed. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy the Minger beat Flynn up, but why push Jerry for weeks on TV and give him his first pay per view victory only to squash him the next night in the Nitro opening match? Make it make sense WCW, make it make sense. Raven and Norman Smiley have joined a Nitro party at the University of Cincinnati. Raven's not too amused at his sister Chastity turning her back on Raven last night at the pay per view and <laughs> he says, if Chastity thought the Dutch ovens were bad as a child, wait and see what Raven does to her and hack. <laughs> Is Raven going to give her an ultra Dutch oven or something? Is he going to shit in her bed? Norman Smiley shows Ricky Rackman how to dance and Ricky just can't compare to the legend that is Norman Smiley. Norman was also at Uncensored last night but we need this man back in the ring ASAP on Nitro. Rick Steiner then had a match against Gentleman Chris Adams, all filler and no thriller in our number one of Nitro. The dogface gremlin took the super kick from Chris but he kicked out at two and Adams ended up getting his ass kicked. The diving bulldog was enough to secure a win for Rick Steiner. Disco Inferno then came out to complain about Conan's music video. The video's been played over and over again on TV and Disco's sick of hearing it. He notices it's on the format sheet for Nitro tonight, so Disco asks the commentators to kindly not play it. Tony Schiavone says he and the boys have no control over such things, and Disco seems pretty confident that the commentators have enough stroke to stop the video airing on TNT. Now, if you watch this Nitro on the WWE Network or Peacock, this segment just abruptly ends right here, so you're gonna completely miss the Conan video airing with a little Disco Inferno sabotage thrown into the mix. Disco booted up Windows Movie Maker to add himself into Conan's latest music video, and this leads to a match between Conan and Disco happening later tonight.
The Raw cuts a promo to open up Raw. On Nitro, Nature Boy Ric Flair addresses the uncensored main event. Jerry Lawler talks about the bad relationship Rock currently has with Big Paul White. Rock thinks there's some sort of conspiracy going on within the corporation, and we aren't sure if Rock's just paranoid or if he's actually onto something. The WWF champ gives his upcoming WrestleMania opponent Stone Cold Steve Austin two options. Austin can lay his head down on some train tracks and wait for the Midnight Rock Bottom special to come rolling down the line, or he can show up at WrestleMania to go one on one with the Great One and Rock will kick Stone Cold's monkey ass all over God's green earth. In regards to Paul White, Rock's been saying for weeks that he doesn't trust the newest member of the corporation, and it's at this moment where the fans start chanting Rocky's name. The dude was just too charismatic and too good on the mic. Austin stirred the pot on Sunday Night Heat and he said he and Paul White were working together, so Rock wants Vince McMahon to come out and explain himself. Vince makes his entrance, looking pretty annoyed at being called out like this, and Vince says he smells what the Rock's cooking and it smells like monkey crop. Vince wonders who the Rock thinks he is calling out the boss like this. McMahon then calls the Rock by his real name, Dwayne, while saying the WWF champ needs to remember who made him. Dwayne needs to remember all the things Vince did for his father Rocky Johnson, and he needs to remember what Vince Sr. did for High Chief Peter Maivia. Rock's showing no gratitude right now. The WWF Championship doesn't belong to The Rock, it belongs to Vince. And both Vince and The Rock need to work together to make sure the championship doesn't go to Stone Cold Steve Austin. McMahon says he thinks of Rock just like he thinks of his own son Shane. The McMahon family have looked after three generations of The Rock's family, and so Vince brought in the big show Paul White to add a little extra protection to the family. Yes, McMahon referred to Paul as the big show here. Paul will never be a family member, but that's okay. He's being paid a handsome amount of money to protect the family. And even though Paul isn't as quick on the uptake as Vince or Rock, the big show will make sure that Rock leaves WrestleMania still the WWF champion. As Paul makes his way down to the ring, Vince announces a Mick Foley vs Paul White match at WrestleMania. The winner of that match will go on to referee the main event. And Paul is not happy with Vince's comments about not being as quick on the uptake. White says he might just cash in one of Vince's checks on The Rock right now and he'll give Vince the change. And McMahon says White was paid a lot of money to come in and do his job, so Vince is going to make sure he gets his money's worth. Vince then slaps Paul and Paul sees red. White brings Vince into the corner, he screams at McMahon to never touch him again, Vince McMahon shits his pants, and Vince comes to the conclusion that maybe he shouldn't have smacked the big man. Vince wants corporate unity, he doesn't want to give Stone Cold what he wants, so tonight Rock and Paul White will team up to take on Steve Austin and Mankind in the Raw main event. The guys look like they're happy with this match booking, so Vince gets both men to shake hands as the promo comes to an end. The big takeaway here for me was how loud the fans were for The Rock, they were cheering The Rock once again. This is the exact same thing that happened when Rock was in the Nation of Domination. After the promo, we see a few handymen come out with a few sheets of wood, they start building something in front of the commentary desk, and when Jerry Lawler questions Bob the Builder here, he says he's just doing his job. We'll come back to this a bit later on. Ric Flair arrives to Nitro with Arn Anderson and a few hookers he found online. Charles Robinson's also walking alongside the new World Heavyweight Champion. They make their way down to the ring. Mean Gene cuts to the chase by asking Charles what the hell was he doing last night, and Double A cuts Robinson off before he gets a chance to speak. Double A says Mean Gene should be congratulating the new champion, and he says Charles Robinson is a professional that called last night's championship match right down the middle. Robinson says WCW owes Flair a great deal of gratitude, but that didn't play a factor into how he called the uncensored main event. Ric Flair, Robinson's boss, told Charles to use his discretion and that's exactly what Charles did. Charles says Flair's wound was superficial, whereas Hogan was badly hurt and Hogan was a badly beaten man. So basically, Charles Robinson, Lil Nage himself, done Hogan dirty. If you watched Uncensored then you'd know that Flair was both busted wide open and covered for the 1-2-3 in the middle of the ring, yet Charles Robinson refused to count. Flair says we're gonna pretend like pro wrestling starts all over again tonight on Nitro. Whether people like it or not, Flair's a 14 time world champion and he's the full time president of WCW. Ric Flair is the most powerful man in the whole sport of wrestling. Bill Goldberg then marches down to the ring and Goldberg says he had Flair begging for his life last week in the Nitro main event. The way Bill sees it, Goldberg's the number one contender for the WCW title and Goldberg wants his shot tonight on Nitro. 
Kevin Nash is having none of it, Big Sexy walks down and he gets in the ring to say he's the number one contender. Ric Flair robbed Hollywood Hogan last night at Uncensored so Nash wants to get revenge for his fallen brother. And as for Goldberg, Big Sexy served Bill his only loss in WCW so that should put Kevin Nash above Billy Boy in the world championship pecking order. Hollywood Hogan then joins the party and Hulk agrees with Kevin Nash. The Hulkster was robbed last night at the pay per view. And Rick then decides he wants to leave the ring and let these guys sort it out themselves. Flair must be feeling pretty guilty right about now. Hogan says he's ready to get his belt back but it looks like Nash wants a piece of Goldberg. Not sure how Hogan came to this conclusion but anyway. Nash wants Goldberg, Hogan wants Flair. So Rick should book a tag team match tonight so these guys can beat the hell out of each other. Flair gets a little heated when asking Goldberg to be his partner and Goldberg pushes the champ to the mat. Goldberg says if he has to team up with Rick to get an opportunity at the world belt then so be it. That's our main event booked and similar to Raw's opening segment, the takeaway here is that fans are now cheering for Hogan and Nash. This might change next week though because WCW aren't too great at keeping, building nor maintaining momentum. The NWO black and white argue amongst themselves next on Nitro, it's riveting stuff. On Raw, the Road Dog takes on Val Venus for the IC title. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Shut up. So Road Dog challenges Val Venus for the IC Championship while later on Billy Gunn's gonna challenge Bob Holly for the Hardcore Championship. The Outlaws are kinda swapping their rivalries around here and this produces some interesting results. The first big move of the match is a spinebuster from Val Venus. A fan in the audience has absolutely no shame as they advertise their need for Vicodin. And Venus keeps control of the match with a back elbow, an elbow drop and a body slam. Val then tries to end it with a money shot but Road Dogg's quite experienced at dodging money shots. James fires back with a shake rattle, you know what, fuck it, he comes back with a dancey punch and dancey knee. We then see the pump handle slam that would eventually become Road Dogg's finishing move and listen to this. In my face. What are you guys doing? The Carpenters are still working at the ringside area and the noise they make is super distracting. Venus tries to use the ropes for leverage during a cover but the referee catches him out. A butterfly suplex from Val follows but it only gets a 2. Road Dog then plants Venus with a DDT and just like that Road Dog becomes the new Intercontinental Champion. It seems so out of the blue and it really messes up the IC title storyline WWF had going on heading into Wrestlemania but Road Dog's the new champion and backstage Stage, Billy Gunn tells his buddy, in a very friendly manner, that he wants a title shot as soon as possible. We cut away to see The Rock telling Paul White he doesn't want nor need his help. Vince isn't here so Rock's just telling Paul the truth. Paul says his job's to cover for The Rock when the great one inevitably screws up and Rock says he'll slap the taste out of Big Show's mouth if he keeps talking like a jabroni. On Nitro, Vincent approaches Horace Hogan backstage and according to Vincent, these two had an agreement last night. Horace was supposed to give the slapjack to Vincent but it was intercepted by Stevie Ray. Horace says no one tells him what to do, Vincent says Horace will do whatever he says because Vincent's the leader of the NWO black and white and Horace is like nah mate, Hogan made me the leader of the NWO so it looks like it's all coming to a head here on Nitro. A little later on, Stevie Ray wants to know why Horace didn't have his back at the pay per view and there must be an echo in the room because Stevie says that he's also the leader of the NWO. When Horace says that's not true, he ends up getting decked. Disco Inferno walks into the room and Stevie tells Disco to send a message to Hogan. No one blows smoke up Stevie Ray's ass and Stevie Ray wants answers. Horace meanwhile wants a match against Stevie Ray tonight on Nitro. Shane McMahon vs The Legion of Dooms next up on Raw, on Nitro we've got Rey Mysterio vs Kidman, again. So Shane wants to prove to X-Pac how tough he is just 2 weeks before Wrestlemania. The Boy Wonder announces that he's gonna face the Legion of Doom right now on Raw, but that's not Hawk and Animal ladies and gents, no it's Patterson and Briscoe, the Legion of Stooge. Vince McMahon says on commentary that this'll be a sufficient warm up match for Shano just before Wrestlemania and check it out, Shane impresses here with a leapfrog and dropkick to Road Warrior Patterson. I do hope Shane doesn't try to do more leapfrogs in 24 years time. 
This one started out kind of friendly with a nice handshake between competitors, but it doesn't take long for Shane to get a little carried away. He steals X Pac's signature move when he delivers a Bronco Buster to both Stooges, and X Pac shows his disapproval while watching the match backstage. The match ends with Shane hitting Patterson with a low blow, followed by a back elbow to Jerry Briscoe. Both members of the Legion of Stooges take shots with McMahon's European Championship, and Shane pins both Patterson and Briscoe to win this two on one match. Vince says he's very proud of his boy before heading back up the rampway, but then The Undertaker's voice can be heard as the Titan Tron shows Vince McMahon's home in Greenwich, Connecticut. Undertaker says the lights are on, but nobody's home yet. Taker says she's coming home, and when she comes back, The Undertaker's gonna be waiting. The Ministry then walk into frame and Vince McMahon goes into a state of panic. He goes backstage to make a phone call to his home security team, but they tell Vince that they haven't seen anyone. A little later on, Shane phones the cops, but the sergeant doesn't believe either McMahon when they report what's going on. The cops think this is another Vince McMahon publicity stunt, so it looks like Vince is getting no help tonight from the boys in blue. The cruiserweight belts on the line over on Nitro, and hey, I do enjoy watching these two wrestle, but I'm also a bit wary of you guys getting a bit fed up at looking at the same matches over and over again. I'll try to get through this one as quickly as possible. Head scissor takedown from Ray, monkey flip from Billy Kidman. Ray performs a dive and hurricane runner when it goes to the outside, but he takes a drop kick when trying to springboard back into the ring. This time it's Ray who finds himself on the outside of the ring and Kidman wipes his opponent out with a plancha, but when we come back from commercial break, it's Kidman getting sent back out with another head scissor takedown. Mysterio pulls off a glorious springboard somersault plancha that gets the crowd going nuts, and he comes back into the ring with a springboard leg drop. Kidman replies with a double underhook face buster that only gets him a 2, and the crowd thinks Ray has it won after a nice power slam counter, but again, it's only a 2. Mysterio pulls off an axe factor and Billy repays Ray by planting his face in the canvas. This looked like it hurt a bit. Kidman goes to end it with a shooting star press and… oh, Mysterio dodges it. The match ends with Kidman pulling off a tornado bulldog, but Ray stops the champ from going upstairs. Ray then pulls off an awesome looking top rope bulldog, and Ray Mysterio becomes the new cruiserweight champion. You know what to expect going into this one, fantastic work as always. My complaint remains the same though, we need some storylines for the cruiserweights and the cruiserweight belt. Generally speaking, no matter how good the competitors are in the ring, there's only so many times people are going to watch the same match over and over again without getting bored of it. Tag team actions up next on both shows, Double J and Owen Hart vs Public Enemy on Raw, Benoit and Malenko against The Barbarian and Hugh Morris on Nitro. Before the Raw match, we get to see what the handyman were building outside the ring. It's Jim Ross's very own announce table. It's pretty funny and pretty petty that Jim would just set up shop right in front of Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler, but that's exactly what Jim's gonna do, and he plans on calling every remaining match tonight on Raw. It should also be noted that Ed Ferrara, a WWF writer at the time, made fun of JR last night on Sunday Night Heat. Many fans forget that this happened on Raw before it happened on Monday Nitro, and the WWE also like to forget this happened when airing their documentaries about the demise of WCW. Michael Cole reveals that other wrestlers backstage aren't getting along with Rocco Rock and Johnny Grunge because of where the public enemy came from. Like, no one else in the WWF came from WCW or ECW, you know. But Public Enemy stated before this match that they don't want anything given to them, they want to earn their opportunities and earn their respect. So why they're being handed a WWF tag team title opportunity is an absolute fucking mystery. Rocco Rock gets crotched at the opening bell, and Jerry Lawler says Public Enemy used to work for two extremely crappy wrestling companies as Owen delivers an Alabama slam. Cole then says the WWF executive committee wanted Public Enemy in the company, and they wanted to give them this title shot to show Rock and Grunge that they're welcome. I'm not sure if those kind of actions would have the opposite effect. The match doesn't last long at all. Grunge gets a lukewarm tag and he tries to clean house, but Double J smacks Johnny with his trusty guitar, and the referee hates Public Enemy so much that he doesn't call for a DQ. Owen ends up covering Grunge and the tag team champions retain their belts via pinfall. The commentators even mention that this should have been a disqualification, and check it out. The referee, Owen, Jeff and Deborah turn their backs on the Public Enemy before heading back up the ramp. 
truth is, many WWF superstars really didn't like Rocco Rock and Johnny Grunge. Their infamous match against the Acolytes happened two weeks prior on Sunday Night Heat, where Farouk and Bradshaw didn't take too kindly to Public Enemy telling them what they could do and what they couldn't do, but I'm sure you know all of this already. On Nitro, the new tag team champions come out for an interview with Mean Gene Okerlund. Benoit says he and Malenko feel like they deserve the tag team titles after what they went through in the tag tournament and what they went through at Super Brawl, and Dean Malenko says he and Benoit are champions due to teamwork and a strong team effort. The Horsemen then issue an open challenge, they put their tag team titles up for grabs, and the challenge is answered by Hugh Morris and the Barbarian. Gotta say, I miss the old era of Nitro when we had teams like Harlem Heat, the Steiners, and even the Outsiders were more active as a team back then. The WWF's improved their tag team division quite a bit, but it's gonna get much better as 1999 continues on. I also think that Benoit and Malenko are better as singles competitors, and I haven't really enjoyed many of their tag team matches so far, but anyway, the Iceman gets singled out throughout this entire match more or less. Benoit gets a hot tag and he hits a German suplex on Hugh Morris. Chris is then taken out briefly, and this allows the challengers to pull off a powerbomb and backbreaker combo, but Barbarian then accidentally hits his partner with a big boot, and Benoit picks up the victory following a diving headbutt. Midian faces the big boss man inside a steel cage next on Raw. On Nitro, Big Papa Pump cuts a promo. Before the cage match, we see Vince and Shane backstage, and Shane says he can send the Main Street posse over to the McMahon residence to make sure everyone's okay. Vince says no, knowing full well the posse couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag. The phone rings, Shane picks it up, he hands the receiver over to Vince, and The Undertaker asks Vince a question. Taker says, it's almost 10 o'clock, do you know where your family is? McMahon then calls a corporate meeting to go over a battle plan for this upcoming cage match. The corporation have a plan, and they want to send a message to The Undertaker by ripping Midian apart. We get about one minute of action inside the cage before the corporation come down to the ring. Test, Shamrock, Paul White and Shane McMahon join the boss man in beating Midian up, and Vince McMahon's gonna use Midian as a bargaining chip to get The Undertaker away from his home. Vince says the corporation will destroy Midian if The Undertaker doesn't get away right now, and we then cut over to Greenwich where The Undertaker says the Ministry are more than willing to give their lives for the Lord of Darkness. It's their mission to serve The Undertaker, so really, The Undertaker couldn't give a shit what happens to Midian inside that steel cage. Taker tells Vince to do what he needs to do and the phenom will do what he needs to do just as a car pulls up to the McMahon residence. And then the camera feed cuts off and Vince once again soils his underwear. He's had to change his trunks about five times already tonight. After a commercial break, Vince and Shane start panicking as Shano tries to phone home. There's no answer of course, so Mr. McMahon just has to hope and pray that his wife Linda and his daughter Stephanie are A-OK -okay back in Greenwich. So, Scotty Steiner is no longer the TV champion and he has Buff Bagwell to thank for it. Scott says the fans are looking at a genetic freak right now. Any hooches in the arena who want some action, the big bad booty daddy will give them satisfaction. This man is an absolute god among men. Scott says the red and black are the best athletes in the world today, but last night someone dropped the ball, and that person was Buff Bagwell. <laughs> Scott says he taught Buff how to train his body, but it's obvious Bagwell didn't train his brain. He should have bought Dr. Kawashima's brain training for Nintendo DS. Not only did Buff cost Scott Steiner, he also cost the NWO. Buff tries to walk away, but Scott pulls him back. And Steiner says ever since Buff hurt his neck, he hasn't been the same. Maybe Buff doesn't belong in the NWO anymore. Buff tells Scott to look at the audience and look at all the Buff Daddy signs, and Scott says that's where Buff and Scott are different. Scott doesn't care about the fans, whereas Buff cares about them a little too much. Buff thinks Scott may be jealous, Scott says Bagwell will always be second best next to Big Papa Pump, and Bagwell says Scott's not Buff and he's not the stuff. Bagwell then tries to squash it, he says he'll apologise again if he needs to, but if Steiner has a problem with Buff Daddy, then Scott needs to address it right now. After a little thought, Steiner decides to shake Buff's hand, but he then takes him out with a belly to belly suplex, and it appears that Buff Bagwell is now out of the NWO. Scott attacks Bagwell with a steam chair, he targets the injured neck, Bagwell then gets locked in a Steiner recliner, and Scott says Buff Bagwell and his fans suck. 
Things are changing within the NWO guys, we are witnessing the final days of the faction right now on Nitro, so for all you folks who were tired of the new world order, be careful what you wish for. Horace Hogan takes on Stevie Ray next on Nitro, on Raw Sable cuts a promo. Before we get Sable's in ring promo, we see a pre taped video where Sable gave Jerry Lawler a tour of the Playboy Mansion. Jerry met Hugh Hefner and old Hugh couldn't keep his grubby hands off Sable. Jerry was also brought to Hugh's dirty grotto where the king was free to do what he does best, that is being a total pervo. He's an animal! An animal! And because Jerry couldn't keep his hands to himself, he ended up getting kicked out of the mansion and he left with a severe case of blue balls. Back in the arena, Sable promises to show everyone her full Playboy spread on the Titantron. Censored pictures then show up on the big screen as Jerry Lawler continues to lose his mind, and Sable says if the fans want to see more, they have to pay up and buy the magazine. The festivities get interrupted when Tori appears on the entranceway. She says the fans can see her for free, which kind of sounds like she's making herself sound cheap, but nonetheless, Tori says Sable's just like any other woman and Tori won't stand in Sable's shadow any longer. Tori challenges Sable to a match at WrestleMania. Sable says she'll drop the bomb on Tori, and Tori then decides to drop a bomb on Sable by taking her dress off. Makes perfect sense. Sable vs Tori is officially booked for WrestleMania. We haven't seen enough of Tori's work to make a fair assessment just yet, but it definitely doesn't sound like a show stealer. Back at the McMahon residence, the cops have finally arrived. There's no one home, so Super Cop here decides to snoop around and check out the bushes. Imagine the Undertaker and Gangrel chilling out in the bushes. Imagine Big Viscera trying to hide and look inconspicuous. A little later on, Vince gets a phone call from Super Cop to say The Undertaker was nowhere to be found. And just when Shane and the Stooges had calmed Vince down a bit, McMahon gets another message from The Undertaker. The dead man says now that that little annoyance is out of the way, it's time to get back to business. Horseman business. Undertaker knows when she is expected home, and as the camera zooms out to show the Undertaker symbol burning in the front lawn, Undertaker says he could be the father figure she never had, or the Undertaker could just torture her. Either way, in due time, McMahon will be witness to the Undertaker's madness. From this pretty damn entertaining storyline to Horace vs Stevie Ray on Nitro. I know I said be careful what you wish for as we head towards the NWO finish line, but really this is a match we could all do without. It doesn't take long for it to go to the outside and into the audience. We have the leader of the NWO in control right now and back in the ring the leader of the NWO takes a high knee from the leader of the NWO. A body slam from the leader of the- no, a body slam from Stevie Ray gets answered with a clothesline from Horace Hogan. Horace then gets a chop in before kicking Stevie a few times in the corner and Stevie fires back with a power slam. Absolutely zero heat here, no one cares and it's always the same story, there's no one for the crowd to cheer for. Vincent walks down to the ring holding a steam chair, he jumps on the apron and it looks like he wants to help Horace. Stevie ends up throwing Horace into the chair and Vincent falls off the apron, and Stevie Ray wins the match via pinfall. It's fucking laughable what's happening to the NWO recently, isn't it? They were once the must see act in all of pro wrestling, what the hell happened? K Dog vs Disco Inferno is our next match on Nitro. On Raw, BA Billy Gunn faces Bob Holly for the Hardcore Championship. So it's the battle of K100 on Monday Nitro. Conan out wrestles Disco in the early going and the Inferno gets hip tossed across the ring. The two go at it again and this exchange ends with a springboard arm drag from Conan. Disco then takes a low drop kick followed by a few kicks to the face, and K Dog then feeds off the crowd's energy for a bit and he's all fired up tonight. A swing and neckbreaker brings Disco into the match and Conan gets set up for a diving elbow following a snapmare takeover. Conan falls victim to a devastating rear chin lock and he gets wiped out with a clothesline after breaking the holds, but Conan gets up and Disco gets planted with a cradle DDT. Disco manages to avoid the tequila sunrise and he foolishly tries to walk away from the match. Disco gets destroyed at the entranceway here, but when we come back from commercial break we see Lex Luger and Miss Elizabeth making their way down the ringside. The Inferno's backup has just arrived. 
back in the ring Conan pulls off a nice float over Bulldog followed by the K Factor face buster but Liz then jumps on the apron to distract the referee and Conan gets whacked with Lex Luger's arm cast. Disco hits the chart buster and Disco wins the match via pinfall. A straightforward no nonsense TV match here, probably the best Nitro match of the night so far not including Rey Mysterio vs Billy Kidman. Disco leaves with his Wolfpack teammates while Conan lays in the ring and Nitro continues on. Over on Raw, Billy Gunn says he's gonna make Bob Holly famous tonight. I see what you did there, Mr. Gunn. The hardcore action starts with Billy Gunn taking a trash can shot while Bombastic Bob gets thrown into the ring steps. JR's having a great time calling this match as the competitors get back in the ring. Badass breaks a broom over Holly's back before grabbing a steel chair. It's Holly who gets the use out of the chair when he plants Billy's face into the steel. The two then go back to the outside where Bob takes a low blow, but Bob then uses his weapon of choice to wipe Billy out, the old glass of Kool-Aid. Back in the ring, Holly lines up a chair shot and Gunn gets smacked right in the face. The same dude who was looking for Vicodin earlier is now advertising snuff videos for sale. So, so edgy. Holly then gets press slammed right out of the ring and Jim Ross is pissed off that Holly broke his new table. Billy Gunn then wins the match and the hardcore championship after planting Bob into the steel chair with a Famouser. Quite the turn of events here with the New Age Outlaws winning singles championships from opposing rivalries. I'd really like to know why this happened because it just completely changes everything heading into WrestleMania, but there you have it. Plenty of new champions crowned this week on Reliving the War. We might get another title change as Chris Jericho challenges Booker T for the TV Championship. On Raw, Triple H calls out Kane. Jericho gets psyched out by Booker T's fancy footwork at the opening bell but he still managed to ground Booker and take the early advantage. Booker's signature forearm shot followed by his hook kick left Chris a little stunned and the TV champ tries to put Chris away with a sidewalk slam but he only gets a 2. On the outside Booker gets thrown into the guardrail and Chris performs a body slam. We come back from commercial break to see Chris miss a drop kick. Booker then catapults Chris into the top turnbuckle and Jericho takes a back suplex. It's Booker T who then misses a drop kick and Chris capitalizes with a lion salt. Booker kicks out a two and Chris takes a spinning back kick. We then see a spine buster from the TV chump and Booker's looking pretty good following an axe kick. Booker then goes up for the heat seeker but Jericho pulls the referee in front of him. Booker then clotheslines Jericho out of the ring and the referee disqualifies Chris Jericho. Booker T retains his TV title on Monday Nitro. I don't know, this Jericho guy might be a good fit for WWF at this point. What do you guys think? Over on Raw, Triple H says that fireball that China took to the face last week was meant for Triple H himself. It just so happens that Kane's Adoken skills aren't up to scratch. Hunter doesn't care for China, but he wants to fight Kane right now in the middle of the ring. These two are also scheduled to face each other at WrestleMania, by the way. So Kane comes out to try and do a little damage before the big match in Philadelphia. As Kane and Hunter fight on the outside, Vince McMahon walks down to the ring and he tells Kane to stop. The big red machine's the only person who can talk sense into The Undertaker right now. So Vince wants Kane to go speak with his brother and end this nightmare Mr. McMahon's currently going through. Just one problem, one pretty big problem. That my friends is not Kane, it's The Undertaker. The reveal gets a huge pop from the audience and when the lights go out Undertaker decides not to attack Vince but he instead sends a warning. Taker says it's just that simple, anytime, anywhere. The lights come back on, the Undertaker's vanished and that's another pair of Vince McMahon's underwear totally ruined. He's not having a great night tonight is he? It's always cool though when The Undertaker wears Kane's outfit. I think this is only the second time it's been done but it's gotten a great reaction on both occasions. Nitro ends this week with Goldberg and Ric Flair vs Kevin Nash and Hollywood Hogan. On Raw, it's Paul White and The Rock vs Mankind and Steve Austin. Ric Flair tells Goldberg to start the match and Goldberg says not today pal. Flair takes a press slam from his own tag team partner and Kevin Nash capitalizes with a big sidewalk slam. Not a great start for Flair and Goldberg. Hogan comes in to lay in a few punches. The champ goes up and over the top turnbuckle and he walks right into a big boot from Nash. Hogan then does a little damage on the outside and when the action gets back inside the ring, Hollywood launches Flair off the top rope. Again, it's a mixed reaction for Hogan tonight. Flair tags in Goldberg after taking a few clotheslines, Billy Boy takes a few shots before delivering a suplex to Hogan. The Hulkster no sells it and the crowd cheer, but when Goldberg no sells a clothesline, the crowd goes absolutely mental. 
Hulk takes a standing sidekick, Goldberg looks pretty pleased with himself and the two circle the ring a little before locking up again. The crowd chant Goldberg's name as Hogan gets the upper hand in the corner. Again, Goldberg starts no selling when Hulk bashes his head off the top turnbuckle. Billy Boy then tries to Irish whip Hulk but Hollywood holds onto the top rope and when Goldberg gets sent into the ropes, Big Sexy's right there to do some damage. Nash is all fired up after getting tagged in. Nash delivers the knee strikes and the back elbows in the corner. The NWO then work together with a double big boot but Goldberg replies by body slamming Big Sexy. It's clear Goldberg doesn't want Flair in the match as the NWO start making quick tags, so Flair decides to clap his hands and come in illegally. Goldberg of course didn't want this, but Rick goes to work on Hulk while Charles Robinson sends Billy Boy out of the ring. Just like last night, Hogan starts hulking up and the fans are with him here. He also punches Goldberg which makes Bill run into the ring only to take another big boot from Nash. Hogan's then able to hit the leg drop while Nash and Goldberg fight on the outside, but referee Charles Robinson refuses to count. This confirms that Robinson's in Ric Flair's back pocket and for once it's the NWO having to put up with a crooked referee. The crowd pops when Hogan decks Robinson and Nitro ends with Hogan getting speared by Goldberg. We have no idea who the number one contender is, but gotta say, it's been a long time since I've been interested in WCW's world title picture and this kinda hooked me back in. It's not brilliant or anything, but it's much better than Goldberg's run last year and the whole Nash and Hogan fiasco in January. Before the Raw main event begins, Rock says he's gonna check Mankind and Austin into the Smackdown Hotel. It's always a good idea to give Rock promo time before matches. Paul White makes his entrance, we aren't sure if Paul and Rock are gonna work as a cohesive unit here but they do pretty well at the opening bell. Mankind takes a beating before Austin even comes to the ring, but the glass shatters, the crowd goes wild and Stone Cold lights out both Paul White and The Rock. It doesn't look like Austin and White are in cahoots at all. Rock gets taken out with the Luthez press before Mankind gets tagged in. Mick Botters Rock in the corner before hitting the WWF champ with his running knee strike. We get Stone Cold back in the ring and he puts Rock in a sleeper hold, but Rock breaks it up by running Austin into the corner. Still, Austin stays in control with a ton of right hands. I thought the crowd at Nitro was loud, but the Raw fans are going insane right now for this main event. Stone Cold goes for a stunner, Rock gets out of the ring, so Rock and Austin fight on the rampway. The champ gets thrown back inside the ropes, Austin does a little more damage before tagging Mick in, and Mick goes for that move he learned from Steve Blackman, the Mavug Elbow. The crowd boo and Paul White kicks Foley to stop the move from happening, and here we go, the big show Paul White gets tagged in, and this is his first real match in the WWF. He was booked in a match against Rock on the 16th of February, but remember, he and Rock attacked special referee Mick Foley and the match never took place. Foley takes a club and blow across the back before Paul chokes him out with his big boot. A big headbutt floors Mankind and now The Rock seems happy with how Paul's handling himself. White delivers a Russian leg sweep before tagging Rocky back in. Mick gets body slammed, Rock throws his elbow pad into the audience and he sends a message to Stone Cold when hitting Foley with a corporate elbow. Austin dashes in to break up the cover and this gives Mick a chance to roll Rock up, but Rock kicks out and Mankind takes a clothesline. This has been a very good Raw main event here, the crowd are absolutely electric. We see some classic heat tactics from the corporation that result in Mick Foley taking a low blow. Mankind gets up and he plants Rock with a double arm DDT. The crowd then jump from their seats when Austin gets tagged in and we get treated to a WrestleMania preview as Stone Cold lays it into the Rock. You can hear Austin shout here we go as he kicks Rock in the corner, he's really feeling it tonight. Austin dodges a rock bottom attempt, Rock avoids a stone cold stunner and the match then breaks down when Austin hits a swinging neckbreaker. Foley and White get in the ring and all hell breaks loose. We unfortunately don't get a clear winner as all four men brawl on the outside of the ring. Stone Cold puts Rock through a table while Paul White's busy with Mankind, but remember, Paul White's job was to protect Rocky in this matchup. He's definitely not doing a good job of it right now. Raw fades out as all four men continue to fight on the outside. A great Raw main event here that could have been better if we got a clean victory from either team. Raw wins reliving the war this week, easily. The Undertaker visiting McMahon's house was great, the title changes were a little weird but still fun to watch, the audience were on fire for the main event, all in all it's a return to form for the WWF. 
As mentioned, the world title picture in WCW has gotten a little more interesting, which can only be seen as a good thing. A heel Ric Flair is also always better than a babyface Ric Flair, but small victories here and there during Nitro's full broadcast wasn't enough to beat the WWF this week. Raw now has 89 points, Nitro has 69 points and it's still nice, and we've got 19 ties on the board. Raw dropped down to a 5.8 rating, while Nitro also dropped slightly to a 4.3. Next week on Raw, it's the go home show before WrestleMania, and Stone Cold has some refreshments for the corporation. We get a title versus title match when Road Dog faces his partner Billy Gunn one on one, and Kane gets a surprise during his scheduled match with Goldust. WCW, meanwhile, arrived to Panama City Beach next week for spring break. Bret Hart's at Club La Vela and he's got a challenge for a certain WCW superstar. We've got a hardcore hack versus Goldberg match, and a special lottery takes place to see who Ric Flair's opponent's gonna be in the Nitro main event. I hope to see you all next week, thank you so much for watching another episode of Reliving the War, and thank you for continuing to watch Reliving the War, and please take care.